this. Well, welcome everyone. Um, for some particular reason, my presentation didn't get loaded, so I'm going to wing it, and uh, hopefully it shows up in a few seconds. But um, what I'd like to share with you really is probably about 40 years of, of involvement in education and, and, and technology, and I've tried to put that in a, in a, in a book here called Rewiring Education. I also have a website, uh, rewiringeducation.com, which has a lot of the backup material because the publishers aren't really keen on color graphs and things of that nature. But um, some of the K-12 challenges that the book talks about, and I'm going to pull three of them out, but I think one is engaging a new generation of students. Uh, I joined Apple in 1978, and my son was four years old. And one of the things that Steve did uh, to recruit me to Apple, one, he shared his vision of why Apple existed. And it really, he saw technology as a mental bicycle. The same way a bicycle amplifies our physical ability, he saw technology amplifying our intellectual ability, allow us to create, to innovate, and go places we've never been before. And that resonated with me because I was building computers that cost a quarter million dollars at the time, and here was this $2,500 Apple II. But probably the most significant thing that he did is he came in my home on a Friday night, he put an Apple II on the kitchen table, and he told my four-year-old son, you can have this if your dad comes to work for me. The TV did not go on, and that little guy went places and did things that I didn't think a four-year-old was capable of doing. So one of the key lessons, I think, is this is a new generation of students. This is a generation of students who've grown up in a, in a digital world. And yet the pedagogy in the classroom remains the same as when I went to school. I think the second challenge that I have observed over the years is we are not leveraging the academic research. The academic research on brain, on learning, on collaboration uh, remains just that, academic research. It has not been integrated into the classroom. Um, the third, I believe, the challenge is to raise the level of expectations of technology. We tend to use technology in a substitution manner rather than in a transformation manner. Um, the fourth, we need to change the classroom learning experience from one that's based on memorization to one that's relative, creative, collaborative, and challenging. And I'll try to pull maybe three of these ideas out in the talk. Uh, fifth, we need to enable personalized learning. Um, you know, Dr. Rose, a good friend of mine, has written a great book called The End of Average, um, where he talks about the fact that we're uh, teaching to the average student and not to the, to, the, to the student that's above average or below average. Hopefully my slides will be here so I can share some things like that. I think we need to reevaluate student assessment. What we measure right now are short-term memories. Not, not potential, not creativity, not future success, but simply short-term memories. We need to raise the, the professional level of the teachers. We need to pay them more. We need to treat them more like accountants and lawyers with ongoing professional development, especially when you've got holograms, augmented reality, adaptive learning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, coming into the classroom from the students. And then um, finally, I think we need a new set of ABCs. And uh, I simply talk about A, B, A is access. We do not have equal access. Uh, we don't have it in the US. We certainly don't have it around the world. B is the students are capable of much more than being consumers of content. They can be creators of content. And C, coding. And I don't say coding because I want everybody to be a coder, but the process to code is the same process to solve a problem to start a company. I do a lot of work with Africa, and um, you know, if I can get the students in Africa starting companies, then we change the economy and we change their world. And so what I wanted to do today, I think it just showed up, is really just talk about three of these, um, because I don't have a lot of time. And uh, I think the first one is the, is the new generation of students. Um, I, have had, I have four kids that I put through college, by the way, that cost me a quarter million dollars each. And I have 16 grandkids, so it's a little bit daunting right now on how to educate 16 grandkids. But I have learned a lot, and that is 
Every one of them have grown up in a digital world, and every one of them are unique. They're, every one of them are different. Every one of them are individuals. And I think that's going to be, that's the fundamental challenge that I think teachers have. And, and as an ex-teacher myself, I uh, taught at Berkeley, I taught at Cal State, I ran a K-12 school for 10 years down the road here, is to help students recognize that unique gift that they have and the passion that they have for something. Because that's the motivation, if you will, that will drive the learning. See if we got have nothing. Okay. So um, that's, I think, the first is just recognizing that this is a, uh, a new generation. It's a generation of students who've grown up in a digital world, and we need a different pedagogy from memorization. And if they can load that up, I'll show you a few pictures there. Um, I think my daughter probably put it the most succinctly. She was a sophomore in college, and she took her first um, art course. And her sorority sister said to her, what are you doing in psychology? You've got this natural gift for art. So she applied to Parsons and became a fashion designer. And she told me, she said, Dad, for 14 years, I pushed the education ball up the hill until I recognized where my uniqueness was and where my passion, I can now chase that ball down the hill. And Joe Ito of the Media Lab, OK, great. I can get going here. I'm going to skip a lot of stuff here. Um, those are the challenges we just talked about. So three challenges that we can have some time. Generation, engage a new generation, change the classroom, and meet personalized learning. Here's Steve and I in the early days. Here's my uh, oldest son, Chris, now sitting in front of a uh, $10,000 Lisa computer, which was the first graphical interface computer. Those boat anchors in the back are 10 megabyte hard drives that cost $1,000 each. Um, I have another picture of a five megabyte hard drive in 1956 that took a crane to load it onto a boat. Um, but he was the first digital native. This is when I returned to Apple at Steve's request in 2002. Uh, this is my grandson. And I think the interesting thing here is if Chris was the first digital native because he was involved in technology and had this Lisa before Pretzky wrote his book or his paper on digital natives. And I'm a digital immigrant because I did not have computers when I went to school, but hopefully after 40 years I'm naturalized. What is my grandson uh, who's sitting, who basically before the iPhone would not talk to me on the phone because he had an eyesight camera and he wanted to see Papa, right? And Alan Kay once said, technology is only technology to those born before the technology, right? And uh, so if you take a quick look at this, this, this would be the students that are entering the university last year. You can see their world. Netscape 94 was before they were born. Um, Google, the, I, the, I, um, the iPod. What made the iPod successful was not the hardware. It was the ecosystem that it operated called iTunes. What made the iPhone successful was not the hardware. It was the ecosystem called the App Store. And what's going to make the iPad successful is an, a learning ecosystem, an adaptive learning ecosystem, which we'll talk more about. But uh, this is our challenge. Uh, these are some of my grandkids. Uh, they're, they're actually, he's uh, not quite two. She's not quite one. Uh, my grandson over there was reading in fourth grade. And I mean reading magazines off the rack. I could not send him to school. They did not know what to do with him in school. So we had to homeschool him. But this is the generation. Uh, this is my family. It's my mom's 90th birthday. So you can see I've got my own Petri dish uh, for, uh, for learning and, ed and education. And every one of those kids is different. And I guarantee you, those of you know who are teachers, that every student in that class is different. And yet, we try to teach them standards. Douglas Adams, I think one of the challenges we have culturally, I think Emerson said, people can only perceive what they see. Douglas Adams said, anything that is in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary, and it's just a natural part of the way the world works. Anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new, exciting, revolutionary. You can probably make a career out of it. But anything that's invented after 35 is against the natural order of all things. Okay, That's our challenge. And the, and the challenge is people. Change. 
All right, so we need to change the classroom learning experience. This was my classroom. It was a distribution channel from the teacher's knowledge to my knowledge. And um, what I want to do is, ch is challenge that. I don't know how many of you read uh, Todd's book, but I pulled this out of his book, and it's in mine as well. And this was from the General Education Board, funded by John Rockefeller in 1912. And it said, we shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of learning or of science. We are not to raise up from them, among them, author, authors, orators, poets, or men of letters. We shall not search for, for great artists, painters, musicians, nor, nor lawyers, doctors, preachers, politicians, statements, of whom we have ample supply. The task that we set before ourselves is very simple, quote, as well as very beautiful. We will organize our children into a little community and teach them to do in a perfect way the things their fathers and their mothers are doing in an imperfect way. That still exists in the majority of our schools today. We do not recognize the, the gift, the individual, the genius of the students. Todd's launching a huge program around individuality uh, that will carry this forward. This was an MIT study where they monitored the brain waves of a student for a week. And as you can see here, the brain waves of watching TV and the brain waves of sitting in class were flat. All right? And I've had teachers say to me, well, yeah, they probably fell asleep in, in the class. And I said, well, here are the brain waves when the kid's sleeping. Okay? And we all know that. You know, we wake up in the middle of the night, we've solved the world's problems, and then we don't write it down, and we get up in the morning and we forgot it, right? But how do we get that type of brain waves into our classrooms today? So we did a lot of research at Apple. The original research was called Apple's Classroom of Tomorrow, which said basically if the student is engaged, they're going to learn. The latest research, Apple's Classroom of Tomorrow today, basically said the pedagogy in a class needs to be relevant, it needs to be creative, it needs to be collaborative, and it needs to be challenging. And you can, I, I created a 3D model that allows you to go into the classroom and plot how much creativity is in there, how much collaboration, and in most cases, it's simply a distribution of content, and it's a, a repeating of that content. So, relevant. This is a, a, a data of the percentage of students engaged in school. It's almost a million students. And as you can see, the relevancy of their education goes down, down, down. And when I spent 10 years at Santa Fe Christian, the first, second grade were very innovative, very creative. They had stores in the back of the classroom. The kids learned math by doing things that were relative. By the time they were in sixth and seventh grade, it was boring as heck. All right. You get a little kick up there in, in the end because they want to graduate. So they got to focus a little bit more, okay? Uh, creative. This is a study by NASA on a creativity test. And you can see in the age five, everybody's creative. But look what happens by the time we become adults. What's going on here? How do we bring creativity back into the classroom? You know, to me, it's coloring outside the lines but we weren't allowed to color outside the lines once we got past second or third grade. Collaborative. Oh, this is the old side of me. This is the zone of proximal development that says that we learn from each other. This is, this is Vygorsky's research. Collaboration, when I went to school, was called cheating because every project I had was an individual project. I never got to work with the smart kids or, or the kids that were, had more tactical uh, abilities. So um, this is really important in trying to integrate into the pedagogy going forward. Challenging. Um, we created a pedagogy called challenge-based learning. And challenge-based learning, the difference between project-based learning and challenge-based learning is that the students pick the challenge, which immediately makes it relevant. All right? And they solve real problems in their community and we've implemented this all over, over the world. And let me give you a really quick example here. This was a project that my youngest son did. Actually, in 2001, he came home and said, Dad, I need to do a science project. And I go, yes, I know you're in biology. You need to learn about the scientific method. What are you interested in? He goes, well, I've been reading about these deformed frogs. And I really want to know what the cause of the frogs are. You know, first of all, i got to catch myself and say, you can't do that because I don't know anything about it. And then I got to say, well, you're not going to find a book in the library. 
I guarantee you, your teacher doesn't know the cause of those frogs. What are you, you going to do? He says, well, I'm going to go to the internet. I said, well, come back. Tell me what you find. He comes back and he goes, three premises. One is ozone layer depletion, ultraviolet light zapping the frog, causing this third leg. Uh, agriculture, uh, pesticides in agriculture land washing into a pond, causing the deformity. And the third was that a professor in a junior college in upstate New York wrote a very short paper where he found a parasite in the frog, one of the deformed frogs. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to email the professor in upstate New York. I'm going to find out where I can get hold of these parasites. I'm going to extract the DNA of the parasite and compare it with the known protein in limb generation. And I thought, oh my god, he's going to fail, you know? And there goes college, right? That's our typical thinking. All right, so he, he meets the professor in Oregon. You know, he's a digital native. He's got his digital camera. He, they, parasites are hosted in snails. They pack them up in dry ice. They fly back to Cooperstown, New York at midnight under electron microscope in the dark. The parasites come out. He teaches my son how to extract the DNA, how to amplify the DNA. He, there's, a, there's a website called Double Twist where you can submit a sequence that comes back and tells you, you know, where it's patented, whether it's where it is in the literature, what it's homologous to, and it comes back and it said, your sequence of that uh, parasite is 98% homologous with the sequence of the, known, of the known protein. Writes up the science fair that says this is equivalent of a terrorist going into the cockpit of an airplane, removing the pilot, and taking a plane in a new direction. Wins the science fair, gets a call from Stanford University's Dr. Doug Brutlock, said, how'd you like to spend your summer continuing your research? And he goes, no, I play basketball in the summer. Okay. But my point here is what these kids are capable of doing given freedom, rather than standard types of things that have been handed out. In my book, the example is California history. And uh, I'll let you take a look at that because you know, everybody in California history in fourth grade has to build a mission. They never learn about presidios, they never learn about anything else. I'm on an airplane two months later and I see this little article in USA Today that Yale University has been awarded a $2.6 million grant to study deformed frogs and there's a whole website of a 14-year-old on the internet at the time. Perfect example of challenge-based learning. Very motivating. So the new learning pedagogy really becomes a symbiotic relationship between the teacher and the student and the community to solve real relevant problems. And the students become the creators. They collaborate so they leverage each other's talents and they take on challenges. And the answers aren't in the back of the book, right? And the interesting thing is, you know, the students who have the most difficult time with this, your honor students because they've always asked the question, what do I need to do to get an A? Not solve problems. And what do we need? We need problem solvers going forward. All right, so here's a quick framework. Uh, education's about delivery, hierarchy, the classroom is the context, the environment's simulated, the content's fixed, the assignments are recipes. Here's the equation for, you know, follow it, no understanding of it. Activities are consumption, repetition, the infrastructure is all about the administration rather than the student. The assessment is teacher driven rather than community driven. The process is standardized. The motivation is extrinsic. I have a whole chapter in my book about motivation. It needs to be intrinsic if you're gonna learn, not forced. And then finally, the expectations are grades and certifications. If you look over on learning, it's skills and experiences. Apple hires skills and experiences, all right? So, Edo, education is what people do to you. Learning is what you do for yourself. All right. So I'm going to skip the SAMR model. Um, now we need to raise, raise the expectation for the role of technology and learning. So it's very important to have you know, 3D printers, uh, uh, creative labs, things of this nature um, to do that. This is actually a uh, third grade coding class in Mexico. Uh, they're sitting on the floor, they got their, and they're coding. All right, all right, final one is meet the need for personalized learning. This is actually a fifth grade class in Chicago, Illinois. And as you can see here in the blue, we've got one kid reading at the eighth grade level, one kid reading at the first grade level. There are six different reading levels in that classroom. If you, if, if you wanted to count the hours that it would take for the teacher to find a unique learning activity for each of those six levels, it would be more than 40 hours a week. So fundamentally, we're asking our teachers to perform a miracle. 
you know. Steve used to ask me to do that, and I'd say, you know, Steve, I believe in miracles, but only God can schedule them. And last time I looked, you weren't God, okay? But we're asking our teachers every week to perform a miracle. And so what happens is we teach to the middle. We teach to the average. And we bore the student at the top, and we freak out in fear the student at the bottom. So looking forward, are our teachers ready? Artificial intelligence, adaptive learning, intelligent assistance, Internet of Things, right? Internet 2.0 is all about connecting things. Right? 3D printing, interactive books, visual reality, augmented reality, holograms. How are we going to prepare our teachers to integrate this into the pedagogy of the classroom? And, uh, you know, if you think about coding, if you think about technology and the impact that it's had, the world's largest taxi company owns no... No taxis. Uber, right? The largest accommodation provider owns no real estate, Airbnb. The largest communication platform owns no telco infrastructure. The most popular media owner creates no content. And finally, the world's most valuable retailer has no inventory. And so my question, and the world's largest movie house has no cinemas. So my question is, is will the largest learning environments, will the largest classrooms, will they even have classrooms? And this is a picture of a little four-year-old teaching his little sister off the content in my book. Content will be free. The question is, how do we put that content in a relevant context going forward? And I'll wrap up with this. This is one of the things that, you know, this was the Pony Express. This was a business model that existed for a grand total of 11 months. And here they, and it was to take Mail from Jostens, Missouri to Sacramento, California. They advertised for young, skinny, wiry fellows, not over 18, must be expert riders, willing to risk death daily. Okay? And this is one of my favorite pieces of artwork. They're capturing the glamour of the Pony Express, and he's waving to who? The people that are laying the infrastructure for communications. Are we the Pony Express in education? or are we laying the infrastructure for the future of learning? So thank you very much, appreciate it. <laughs>